first the aftermath of World War II. Oh, and let me say, I am not in any way a specialist, so I don't consider myself a specialist on this topic. I'm just an interested layman, and I thought that you might also be interested in what's going up in our backyard, so to speak. In the five years encompassed by World War II, the world was witness not only to horrific bloodshed of servicemen and women, but also to the wanton massacre of civilians on a scale unprecedented in history. The massive toll of human life was facilitated by the use of lethal modern weaponry so much more efficient than that of the past. The Axis powers, Germany, Japan, Italy, Hungary, Austria and Finland, lost six and a half million military personnel and one and a half million civilians, while the Allied powers, Soviet Union, China, Poland, Yugoslavia, France, Czechoslovakia, United States, United Kingdom, Netherlands, Greece, Belgium, Canada, India, Australia, Albany, Bulgaria, New Zealand, Norway, South Africa, and Ethiopia, all the Allies, they lost 14 and a quarter million military personnel and 25 and a half million civilians. So all told, the Axis powers lost 8 million as against 40 million Allied deaths. Now, rapidly developing technology has consigned the best World War II weaponry to the scrapping and has rewritten the strategy textbook. After World War II, the geopolitical centre of the world lay in the Western Hemisphere. The United States exercised its hegemony over the countries surrounding the Atlantic, Indian and Pacific Oceans, and they engaged the Soviet Union in a Cold War until the Soviets' demise in 1991. That changed forever the world power structure. In the 70 years since the end of World War II, the balance of military power has slowly shifted from the Western Hemisphere to the Eastern Hemisphere, and the weaponry emphasis has shifted from land-based armies to air forces and navies, to submarines and aircraft carriers, and all sizes and kinds of sea craft, to satellites and land-based missiles, and sophisticated sea mines, and cyber warfare, and unmanned surface surveillance ships that sail the lonely sea for six months before reporting back to base, to fearsome aircraft whose offensive and defensive capabilities are beyond belief. The weaponry is as impressive and deadly as it is expensive. In this 70 years, there have been more than 50 separate wars which says something about the natural propensity of man to fight with fellow man. Uh, the current example, of course, uh, lies with Daesh in the Middle East, where a vicious land and air and terrorism war is currently being raged with, uh, with ferocious intensity. The attention of the world is currently centered on that conflict. Let's look at the broad sweep of power in the area of the China Sea. 
recognized by the world's foremost strategists as one of the most important and dangerous hotspots in the world right now. This relatively small stretch of water uh, is bounded by nine modern states, of which China is, of course, by far the largest, the most populous, and the strongest militarily. Nearly all the countries bordering this sea feel threatened by the size and power of China, belligerent uh, attitude towards its neighbours. Now, why should this be so? To understand this, we really need to look back at least two centuries into the recent history of China and Asia, and it is vitally important that we as Australians understand the forces at work right now, for they're operated in our backyard and they're not likely to go away. After the end of World War II, feeding on the disinterest of the war-weary nations of Europe, the countries in Asia began to flex their muscles uh, and to begin to spread communism uh, across the land as the countries threw off their colonial shackles. The Koreans and the Chinese fought the Americans and eventually split the Korean Peninsula into two. Vietnam and China expressed their long-standing hatred of one another by skirmishes now and then to the point where China invaded Vietnam with a hundred thousand troops in 1979. She took, them, she took them out only a month later. Um, then Vietnam took on France and America and beat them both. Uh, communism was growing stronger and by the end of the century was dominated in many, uh, was dominant in many countries of the Far East. In this metamorphosis, the center of geopolitical gravity slowly shifted until now, in the eyes of most international strategists, it lies in the South China Sea. And its focus has switched from the land to the sea and the air. Here, some nine countries, including America, have expressed their territorial interest and have laid down claims to various sections of the sea. And China is the main claimant. In 1947, the Chinese government officially claimed a large portion of the South China Sea as its territory and it marked nine dashes on the map encircling an area which it henceforth referred to as the Nine Dash area. Because of its shape, the Chinese called it the Cow's Tongue. It embraces almost the entire waters of the South China Sea, which cover one and a half million square miles, uh, and out of a total Pacific area of 64 million, so it's not all that great as a part of the total Pacific. It includes the Spratly Islands in the south, Paracel Islands in the center, and the Pratus Islands in the north. The United States has always claimed hegemony over the Pacific Ocean and its military presence received a severe blow in 1991 when it had to abandon its two most powerful military bases in the Philippines after they were wiped out by the catastrophic eruption of Mount Pinatubo. That disaster 
remove the dominance of the U.S. in the South China Sea and lift a power vacuum which China lost no time in filling. In February 1992, eight months after the U.S. reluctantly abandoned its Philippine bases at Clark Field and Subic Bay, Beijing made an announcement that 80% of the South China Sea was now to be formally considered Chinese territorial waters. For some time now, the Chinese have been dredging the sea surrounding these low-lying atolls and building them up. Then they claim them as Chinese territory. Then they proceed to build harbours and houses and concrete buildings and extensive runways and submarine bases and missile bases. The most advanced of these, of these new islands as it were, is Woody Island in the Paracels. Now China has also delineated a line joining a chain of islands running from Japan in a southwesterly direction down along the eastern side of the South China Sea. And they refer to this as the first island chain. Uh, and Deng Xiaoping and Admiral Yu Huaqing plan to have it secured with a military presence by the year 2000. Their adjective secured is taking the mean that they believe they have attained hegemony. That having been done, in their view, the Chinese have now turned their attention much further east to the South uh, China Sea uh, uh, to what they refer to now as the second island chain further east. Uh, so China is now encroaching on territory hitherto considered to be of intense interest to the US. China hopes to secure this area in due course. There's yet a third chain further east, which includes Hawaii, uh, and it's hoped in China's long-term planning to secure that by 2049, which is exactly 100 years after 1949, in which the People's Republic of China was proclaimed when Chiang Kai-shek sailed across the sea with an army and lots of treasures. Uh, so the next great and humiliating shock for the Americans was in October 2006. The 80,000 ton aircraft carrier Kitty Hawk was on exercises in the Pacific with its uh, escort group, a cruiser, two destroyers, 70 aircraft and other odds and ends. While they were dumbfounded to uh, see a Chinese Song-class attack submarine, brand new and deadly, surface files five miles from the centre of the strike group. All of this with the United States Navy's full submarine detection equipment in operation. The Chinese were making a statement of strategy uh, in the open sea. The American security equipment had not detected the sub. Could anything really be more humiliating than that? The result was the formulation in 2009 of a term of a team of strategists by Andrew Marshall, who was head of the 
Pentagon Office of Net Assessment to develop a program of countermeasures to undersea warfare known as the concept of air-sea battle. It reduces the role of any army component in the coming contest, if there is one, and concentrates instead on the abilities of the Navy and the Air Force. <coughs> well, we've been talking about the two main players in this chilling game, and what about the other ones? Heading south from China coast, we have Vietnam, with its long north-south coast. Then comes Malaysia in the south, plus Singapore and Indonesia. And then heading north, we have Borneo, Brunei, the Philippines, and finally, Taiwan closes the Khao's Tung Circle. Further northeast, actually bordering what's known as the East China Sea, we also have some very interested and powerful parties, namely China, Korea, and Japan. Not to mention the USA, which makes no bones about its interest in the Pacific Ocean and East Asia. All of these countries lay claim to some part or parts of the South China Sea, and they all with the exception of China, regard the waters as international and treat them as such. These countries have clashes with China from time to time, almost from day to day. Now, they are all uh, rearming at a frenetic rate, spending billions of dollars on their weaponry, and dusting off their mutual defense treaties with the USA and with their neighbors. Australia is immersed in this territorial handshaking. Uh, and I'm sorry that I don't have uh, time to look closely at the detail of the build-up of weaponry by these individual countries. It, it's quite ominous but a cursory glance at their import activity in the last 15 years shows a burgeoning rearmament. South Korea, for instance, has doubled its defense budget to 1.2 trillion, including six new destroyers, each carrying 128 guided missiles. Vietnam recently concluded a multi-billion dollar deal with Russia to purchase 12 state-of-the-art kilo submarines. Australia is proposing to spend a whopping $279 billion in the next two decades on 12 submarines, nine frigates, 12 patrol vessels, 72 joint strike fighters, and many other armaments. To understand China's desire to regain territory that has once belonged to her, one has only to look back two centuries. In the 19th century, she lost a great deal of her territory. She lost landlocked Nepal and nearby Burma, now Myanmar, to Great Britain, and she lost Indochina, now Vietnam, to France. Further, she lost the tributaries of Korea and Sakhalin to Japan, <coughs> and she lost Mongolia to Russia. In the 20th century, there was the murderous takeover by Japan in the 30s of the Shandong Peninsula and Manchuria which prompted full-scale war and which the Chinese have not forgotten or never will. Then there was the ongoing humiliation of the treaty ports, which in 1841 gave European powers control over parts of all the important Chinese cities. 
this system lasted for a hundred years to 1941. And finally, as I mentioned, Chiang Kai-shek fled with an army and a massive stock of national treasures in 1949 to Taiwan and declared it an independent nation. These indignities lie very deep in the Chinese memory. Now, Robert Kaplan, the renowned American geopolitical analyst, says, quote, China's very urge for an expanded strategic space is a declaration that it never again intends to let foreigners take advantage of it as they did in the previous two centuries, close quote. And who could blame them? Kaplan also goes on to say, quote, America must be prepared to allow for a rising Chinese Navy to assume its rightful position as the representative of the region's largest indigenous power. Close quote. Well, it was the, how did all this come about in the last two or three centuries? It was the brilliant visionary Deng Xiaoping, who after the Cultural Revolution and the death of Mao in 1976 and the subsequent discreditation of the Gang of Four, repudiated Marxist economics and with his much publicized three-pronged plan set China firmly on the road to becoming the important member of the global economy that she now is. Agriculture was the first prong, business and manufacturing the second, and defence the third. They were to be revitalised in that order. In an astoundingly short time, beginning in 1978, he transformed Chinese agriculture encouraging private ownership and enterprise and cutting drastically the amount of grain that had to be given to the state. He then turned to the second prong, industry, which he was determined to modernize. In 1983, as part of the new industry rejuvenation plan, the Chinese government invited me to give a series of lectures on efficiency in business at several Chinese universities. Deng also set up special economic zones to encourage, final, uh, to encourage foreign countries to invest there under favorable terms. They were very successful, these special economic zones. In 1987, I traveled to one of them, the Shenzhen Special Economic Zone. I was then a director of a Malaysian registered company which a friend had set up for the manufacture of stationery, taking advantage of Deng's investment incentives. After the zone was, uh, already the zone was flourishing. In the four years since I'd been there previously, the transformation was astounding. Deng's third prong was increased military might, and he set about pursuing that objective relentlessly, increasing the country's manufacturing capability uh, in shipbuilding and aircraft, and in more recent times, using its immense wealth to purchase expensive armaments from abroad, and this, of course, to the grave concern of surrounding countries. There's no doubt that China wants to claim hegemony over this part of the globe. For a long time now, it has made its intentions crystal clear, uh, and its neighbors are increasing their armaments at a great rate, for they fear Chinese strong military presence and her recently aggressive behavior. She plans to have a mix of 80 
conventional and nuclear powered submarines by 2020. <laughs> Not very far away. Uh, since 2008, China has been building submarines at a much greater rate than the United States. To counter this, more SSBMs, uh, ballistic missile nuclear submarines, are being built in the United States and sent on deep water patrols to the Pacific. The undersea fleet of the United States, which is completely nuclear powered, currently includes 55 attack submarines and 14 <laughs> nuclear ballistic missile submarines as well as four guided missile submarines. In the air, China's main adversary, the USA, has a stealth fighter which has an impressive all-round performance. Uh, the other string to America's bow, apart from its F-22 Raptor stealth fighter, uh, is the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, which is the one that Australia has purchased. Uh, Australia is buying these to replace its, uh, to replace its aging F-18 jets. The F-35 uh, Lightning II, it is, uh, has run into uh, teething problems and is being criticised from many quarters. The news that China, uh, Canada, has cancelled its uh, 75 aircraft order is rather unsettling. Uh, on the other hand, two Australian squadron leaders, instructor pilots in the United States, currently teaching others to fly the F-35, claim that it can handle any threat from enemy aircraft or missiles with ease. It all depends really, it's not, much, not, not so much what you see from an air aircraft, it's what's inside there and it's also what's inside the helmets of the pilots that throw, fly up out. Australia has 72 of these on order with a current price tag of $24 billion. Each aircraft costs $330 million. These aircraft have unbelievable defence capabilities. The Russian fighter aircraft counterpart to the F-35 is the Sukhoi 35 Super Flanker which is being bought by many nations. It has so far proved very popular in comparison to the American F-35 in various simulated exercises and in performance at various shows. The Lightning is slightly uh, faster and has a slightly higher ceiling but is outscored by the Super Flanker in many other respects. Some strategists are urging Australia to change its mind and buy the Russian aircraft. Australia currently has a committee looking into that. On the surface of the sea, there's a large variation in quantity and quality of ships. China is rapidly building up its navy of smaller ships, mostly corvettes. The seas in the South China Sea are relatively shallow and uh, so it, it's building the smaller ships like corvettes rather than larger. Um, at present uh, China has only one aging second-hand aircraft carrier. Uh, <coughs> Although uh, it's lagging behind here, but hell-bent on catching up, it has now three new partial carriers bought from a 
Australia and Russia, and these are being fitted out, and two more are being built in Shanghai. They are nevertheless way behind the Americans on surface ships, and America has uh, 12 carrier groups which are very lethal. Uh, turning to undersea ships, the Russian Kilo-class submarine is very popular in the South China Sea region. Russia has stopped making these for itself. I guess they figure they've got enough. Uh, but it's selling them at a great rate to the navies of the Pacific. Uh, the uh, uh, Kilos carry some very sophisticated weaponry and are very quiet which is the main thing with a submarine. Uh, the US Navy openly acknowledges that it cannot track the Nautilusisk 451 when it's submerged. The sea is the site for most of the teeth bearing that is going on at the moment. There's constant activity and use of weapons on, on maneuvers Take the submarine, for example. It has emerged as the weapon of favour these days. They are there are approximately 700 different types of submarine operating today in the oceans of the world. The Royal Navy, our closest associate, has submarines, submarines ranging in size from 4,000 tonnes to 16,000 tons. Their latest class, Astute, is their largest at attack submarine with a crew of 100, capable of submerged speed of 32 knots. Uh, like its counterparts, it has an awesome armory, including acoustic and wire-guided torpedoes, plus submarine-launched Tomahawk missiles with a range of 2,000 kilometres and an accuracy of, wait for it, one metre. Uh, other governments have similar awesome arg armaments. The largest submarine in the US Navy, Navy the USS Pennsylvania, displaces 17,000 tonnes. Now, just imagine the size of that. And it's nuclear powered. It can dive to 250 metres and stay there for six months. Uh, so it, it carries at the same time 24 nuclear missiles and it can deliver more explosive force than a combined total of all explosives unleashed in both world wars. This is one submarine. Australia has just made up its mind on which country is going to build its new fleet. It did so a couple of days ago, as you will have seen in the paper. The three chosen contract countries were France, Germany, and Japan. Their confidential bids were lodged in November 2015. The successful tenderer is France. The contract for our 12 suborders is $50, 50 billion. So you can see that our country is very serious about acquiring a sophisticated state-of-the-art underwater defence system. According to its specifications, our country wants the largest and most sophisticated conventional submarine ever built, a boat of 4,000 plus tonnes with a US combat system and the ability to fire cruise missiles and deploy, deploy special forces. And the government insisted that it be built in Australia. Our chosen boat will displace 4,500 tonnes and be almost 100 metres along, along with a crew of 60. It will not have a propeller, but it will use a new pump jet system of propulsion to cut down noise. 
it will have the most powerful sonar system ever produced for a conventional submarine. Its stealth system, using a pump jet, is apparently what tipped the scales to France. The Australian model will be called the short fin Barracuda. It will be modeled after the current French Barracuda uh, nuclear submarine. Now to turn from Australia's internal strategic considerations to the broad sweep of natural strategies currently existing in waters close to us. The South China Sea has now become a cauldron bristling with dangerous possibilities. As we've seen, China has long laid claim to the area in pragmatic terms it's obviously vital to China because it's the only convenient sea lane giving egress to much needed supplies and entry to the world's oceans for trade. 60,000 vessels pass through the Straits of Malacca uh, and this includes uh, tankers holding more than 13 billion barrels of petroleum, which China depends upon. Drilling for oil and natural gas is pressing ahead, and the massive fish stocks provide areas of contention as the Chinese fishermen uh, operate in disputed waters protected by aggressive Chinese boats. Does all this presage um, conflict in the future? Not necessarily. As China and America come closer together in military capacity, they may also come closer together in trade relations. Each country is the largest, already the largest trading partner of the other. And incidentally, there are 121 countries in the world right now of whom China is the largest trading partner. Xi Jinping, China's president for the next eight years, recently visited the US to discuss mutual interests, including trade. If at the same time, improving trade prospects. China can resolve its difference with Taiwan, which currently shelters under the wing of the US. Pressure will ease off a bit, and a delicate balance of power may be established. One does not know what the rogue, rogue state North Korea is going to do in the future, but I hope China can be relied upon to keep it from igniting a dangerous conflict. And sitting to the north is an implacable enemy of China and a close friend of America, Japan. In recent years, she's lost the trading dominance she possessed 20 years ago. Tokyo, her largest trading port, is now dwarfed by many Chinese ports. Shanghai has eight times the capacity of Tokyo. Seven of the world's top ten container ports are currently in China. But trade aside, Japan is now very powerful militarily. She has a modern air force and her navy is several times larger than the British Royal Navy. She's a close ally of the United States. Casting its legal shadow over the South China Sea and indeed the other areas of the world is the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea which was held in 1982, not long ago. It laid down a comprehensive regime of law and order in the world's oceans and seas. 
It threw a legal framework over all maritime actions on the high seas related to the land holdings of the countries surrounding it. When it came into evidence, of course, it destroyed the rationale of the cow's tongue with its delineation of territorial boundaries, much to the chagrin of uh, China. It's of interest that China, which breaches the law often, is a signatory to it, while the US, which insists on observing it, is not. <laughs> the law is the arbiter of territorial disputes in the region, so we already have a worldwide legal framework within which to operate. As well as the multinational United Nations overseeing the area with its legal framework, we also have another multinational body bringing together 10 countries in the region, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. It was formed in 1967 by Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore and Thailand. Later they were joined by Brunei, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar and Vietnam. The body includes all the nations I have previously mentioned that shows some apprehension about China's burgeoning strength. One of the aims of ASEAN is protecting stability in the region. So, where does Australia sit in all this? We are palsy-walsy with China and we are very close ally with the US. We have treaties of friendship with many of the countries in the region. We already have a US marine base in Darwin and there's talk of converting Fremantle into a harbour capable of receiving and servicing carriers and of expanding the Garden Island submarine base into a major base for the US Navy. Our ideal scenario would be for the situation in Asia to quieten down with China toning down its aggressive behaviour and continuing to grow economically. In that case Australia can do more and more trade with it. If the US can continue to develop more trade ties with China while continuing to remain militarily strong enough in the region to preserve a balance of power, there's a chance for continued peace. Balance is the whole key here. The various friendship treaties that almost all the countries of the region have made with America and also Australia may assist, may assist to dampen down the state of tension that is developing in this part of the world. The possibility of anti-Chinese military alliances is very real. Uh, thus, the key to peace in the region is the maintenance of balance. To achieve this, it's imperative at some stage of the game for the United States to realize that it should cede hegemony of the South China Sea to China. The Western and Eastern Hemispheres could then perhaps live in balance. It may well be only three or four decades before China can be in a position to attempt to take back some of its territory lost by force. And a lot can change in that time. Even now, of course, the Chinese economy is under siege economically, which may seriously affect its immediate future. It should be so obvious to both the US and China that they can act to each other's mutual advantage by decreasing rearmament and increasing trading ties because each is already the largest trading partner of the other. 
To do so should be, should be a foregone conclusion. Hopefully, the ultimate arbiter is really common sense. The perception of the massive destruction and loss of life that would follow a full-scale war doesn't bear thinking about. Many experienced strategists believe that the Chinese leaders are rational actors and have generally avoided serious international strategic mistakes and that their bark is worse than their bite. We have to hope that all the other players in this unfolding drama are rational too and that the world will never again have to face wholesale bloodshed of World War II. Is that too much to hope?